the concepts of quantum field theory and quantum mechanics may seem overlapping or a bit grey, yet discerning the nuances between these theories is paramount, for it paves the pathway to a deeper understanding of the universe's inner workings. Understanding the relations, differences and concepts between these theories is similar to deciphering the intricate threads of reality. Each concept adds a new layer of comprehension, enriching our perception of reality. By discerning these differences, we transcend the confines of superficial knowledge, embracing the profound interconnectedness that underpins the universe. So, this video will not only teach you the concepts and ideas but also open up your eyes to a whole new horizon where you will discover how understanding the subtle differences gives you a greater command and mastery of a particular subject. My name is Shonak and you are watching this video on my channel Physics for Students. Welcome to this fresh news video, Quantum Field Theory and Quantum Mechanics, Understanding the Deep Connections, Fundamental Concepts and the Relationship Between Them. Now, before going ahead with this video, what if I ask you, what is the difference between a planet and a dwarf planet? I know, you will say, yes, I know. What is the difference between magnetic flux and a magnetic field? Yes, I know that you know. And what is the difference between the red shift and blue shift? You know. And what is the difference between temperature and heat? You also know. So the question is that why I am asking or why we are studying all these differences? The basic understanding that difference between the concepts of physics and mathematics leads to a better understanding. Let us demonstrate. Now, for example, if I say that what is the difference between planet versus a dwarf, dwarf planet? I, I mean to say, I'm not going to give you the answer because you already know. But as soon as you try to understand the difference, it means that it gives you a better understanding of astronomy. Because planet is a celestial body that is orbiting around the sun and uh, dwarf planet, it also orbits around the sun, but it is massive enough for its own gravity. That means what? It is giving you a better understanding of astronomy. It is giving you a better understanding how celestial shapes differ. And it also gives you a better understanding of how gravity works here and there. Because in case of a planet, massive enough for its own gravity to pull it around a nearly round shape. But in case of a dwarf planet, massive enough for its own gravity to pull it uh, into a nearly round shape. That means you are getting an understanding of how the shape and the celestial bodies etc. do. Also, when I ask you what is the difference between magnetic field and a magnetic flux, that means you get a better understanding of magnetism because magnetic field itself is an invisible force that is surrounding a magnetic object, maybe an earth or some stars, whereas magnetic flux is basically the total amount of magnetism through a given area. That means you know that how scalar and vectors are related. That means you already know that how the SI unit changes because in case of a magnetic field, it would be be Tesla and for uh, example for a magnetic flux it would be Weber or WB. So you again try uh, understanding visualize abstract shapes because you have to imagine that this is a magnetic flux so there is an inflow of certain things which are flowing like a water or a river. Now basic thing is that you see that it gives you a much much deeper understanding of the concepts. Let us move outside the physics concepts and let me ask you a simple question that what is the difference between these three prepositions under, beneath and below? Well, under refers to the position directly below something and it suggests a close physical proximity. Beneath something similar to under but it signifies a position below something. For example, however, beneath would uh, often implies being covered by something. Below, the term indicates a lower position in more general sense, but not necessarily un directly underneath. So you see that comparing with planet, dwarf, magnetic flux and redshift and blue shift, even if we shift our understanding to prepositions, we see that we need a better understanding of prepositions. And can you tell me what is the difference between these three, above, over and upon? Well, I'm not going to tell. If you know this, please do let me know uh, in the comment section uh, of this video. So from here, what we get to know is that a deeper understanding of the subject, a stronger foundation of further study. Because once you know those subtle differences, you get a better mastery of the subject. 
coming to the next part of the video automatically it crops up a question why you should learn the difference coming up into the next part of the video so you understand that physics and understanding the differences actually opens your horizon to a much better learning what are those Point number one, it actually promotes a deeper understanding. Why? Because delving into this kind of a subject, delving into the nuances that distinguish between one to another, it gives you a deeper understanding of the underlying principles governing each area. You also see that it is an ability to connect, uh, connect other in, uh, interdisciplinary connections because many areas of physics overlap or intersect with each other. So once you understand the differences between related subject enables you to identify these connections and appreciate how knowledge from one field can be informed or can be enriched into another. Obviously, it clarifies concept because you just saw between magnetic field, magnetic flux, even prepositions. Understanding the distinction between two subjects, you gain clarity on their individual concept and principles. It also, uh, you know, clears a lot of confusion because knowing the differences can prevent confusion between similar concepts or phenomena. Uh, I would also like to say that it actually fosters interdisciplinary connections. What do I mean by that is many areas of physics overlap and intersect. And once you understand this concept, you can actually move from one discipline to another. The next one would be, yes, it supports specialization because in advanced study or research, having a clear understanding of the distinction between these two subjects allows you to specialize in a particular area more effectively and this is quite certain because until you really understand the subtle or the gross differences you will never be able to uh, i would say uh, you know understand specialization and the last one most important yes for educators if you are teaching or you want to become a teacher it uh, understanding the differences between subject is essential for designing a very coherent curricula and delivering effective instruction. Similarly, students benefit from this knowledge as it is an aid in their comprehension and retention of physics concepts. So as an educator, as a teacher, it is very important for you to teach and learn actually those subtle differences so that you can actually lead to an understanding and you can let people know that these are the differences and how the concepts are related to each other. So this is, as you can see, that before starting the video, uh, I have already laid out a clear objective why you should learn the differences. And now we come to the first most important quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, the differences which are related to particles. I won't say verses, but particles and fields coming up into the next part of the video. So now you see in quantum mechanics, if I take that particles are actually treated as point-like objects. Now, this is an analogy. It is called a point-like object because it is easy to visualize with well-defined positions and momenta. These particles, uh, obviously, they follow trajectories in space-time and their behavior is described by wave functions we will come to know later. Now, in terms of quantum field theory, you see fields are the fundamental objects of study. So, here is a shift. Shift in terms of uh, your mental thought, shift in terms of mathematical domain, because the moment you start thinking of point-like particles, it uh, seems like billiard balls. There's a position, there's a momentum, there's an energy, everything. But the moment I go, if we go into quantum field theory, which is a field, field is something very abstract. So that is why the shift happens. So uh, in case of a classical world, we think particles as what? They are tiny, they are localized, maybe billiard balls to imagine. And they have already a well-defined momenta, position, etc., which is easy to visualize. And here you can see in this uh, uh, picture that quantum mechanics uh, includes electrons, protons and uh, photons. These particles are what? They are treated as fundamental entities and they are particles. So they have a mass, they have a charge, they have a spin. Very easy, easy to realize. So uh, also we should know that in quantum mechanics particles are considered to be localized and particles exhibit both what? The wave like part and particle like behavior which we called it as wave particle duality which is the fundamental i would say underpinning um, area of quantum mechanics so this wave particle behavior is being understood by our wave function also very important is that quantization so the properties of particles whatever we are dealing in classical notion such as energy and momentum are quantized because the quantization is the first principle of quantum mechanics and this quantization 
is actually you know it described by this greek letter psi why because it describes the probability of a particle's quantum state quantum state means where the particle would be what with the position momentum and spin etc so here you see that we have just started uh, dealing with what is called the uh, particle like behavior which is very easy to understand very easy to visualize very easy to quantize and very easy in our terms to do the mathematical calculations we come to the next uh, bizarre world of quantum field theory now here you see on the left hand side we i have drawn few particles and here it gets generalized into fields and fields are what in quantum field theory we say fields are the mathematical objects that permeate all of space time and most importantly this is a graphical you know animation which you can see so uh, here you can see these bubbles i mean to say they are just you know uh, you know coming and going and coming and going so fields exist throughout space time and as you can see it is continuous now this term continuous will bring us to the mathematical shift which i will come later so let us understand from the discrete particles we move into fields and these are nothing which we can actually see but it is a mathematical object that permeates all space time fields exist throughout space time continuously varying from one point one uh, point to another and if i take a space say for example this one if i space a, take a space in general space then quantum field theory takes this part this part this part and what it does is that it is a mathematical object that assigns a value to every point in space and time as we i i i mean to say if you have watched my other lectures in quantum field theory i have uh, i have explained how the uh, in history that this first quantization the second quantization etc took place so what was the basic purpose that we need to quantize each and every part of the space so these values can represent physical quantities such as electromagnetic field through density etc so let us imagine that fields exist throughout space and time continuously and they vary from one point to another and the mathematical object that is the space time is trying to assign a particular value at every point in space and time so uh, this is the first difference very fundamental in terms of going ahead with the mathematics etc that how particles are now being treated as fields and that is why uh, if you have seen my earlier video i told that classical field theory is the first step in order to understand uh, quantum field theory now here again you see particles are considered as excitations or quanta underlying fields so the first misconception it is not that qft does not speak of particles definitely qft do speaks uh, uh, speaks of particle but the problem is that the particles are no longer visualized as billiard balls which will have a single position moment no it is just an excitation it is an excitation or quanta which is lying in the underlying field so in quantum field theory the concept of field goes beyond the simple idea of physical quantity like temperature or pressure that varies across space and time here is is a kind of a deeper idea which i just explained so this fluctuating entity is denoted by this one psi within a space as x and t where x represents a point in space and t represents time and most importantly here comes the uh, most important thing that the field itself is a quantum entity and this field actually uh, shows what is called a particle creation and what is called a particle annihilation and for your information this part i mean to say how particles are created you can see this is a feynman diagram so how particles are created how particles are annihilated they are never explicitly described in quantum mechanics why obviously there was a limitation because it considered particles as single entities which will have this 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 i hope this point is clear so this quantization allows for the creation and annihilation of particles as excitation which can jump on between different energy levels which i am going to show so first of all there are different examples of field for example it can be electron field it can be a photon field and most importantly very recently the higgs field so let us understand there is not just one universal field uh, i mean to say which qft proposes as a separate field for each type so there are different levels of the field let me explain this part a little bit more in the next part of the video 
So, in case of a classical field, we take it as a single value, right? As I told you, temperature, a field, etc. And a quantum field is not a single value. As you can see, I have taken this from internet. It is a field which also contains particles. So, quantum field does not have a single well-defined value at every point. It is what? This one on the right-hand side. It is a complex mathematical object whose values at specific point represents the probability of finding at a certain type. So, the basic notion of probabilism is there. But it is basically a mathematical space where it is not assigning a single value. And that is why the complications or the, I would say, further mathematical uh, developments happen. So, and also most importantly, as you see, the default state of the field is the lowest energy state. So, on the left hand side, you have seen this. these are the colored lines which uh, defines n equals to 0, 1, 2 and a similar kind of a graph which uh, shows this. So, the default state of the field is its lowest energy state which is called a vacuum. I mean, the vacuum is not that vacuum as you think because QFT does not teach, uh, does not teach you that uh, everything is totally empty. But let us say it's a vacuum. So, when the field gets excited in a particular region of space-time, that excitation corresponds to the presence of the particle. And the different excitations of the field can represent different types of particles with different types of properties like mass, like spin and charge and so on. So, this is the fundamental thing that the probabilism remains but the default state is the lowest energy state often called vacuum. So, vacuum does not mean that it is empty, it still has something. And if you can remember uh, when Stephen Hawking, uh, what he told that is called Hawking radiation, that the particles are emitting right at the event horizon, he actually talked of something like this. I mean to say, general theory of relativity, getting married seemingly with uh, quantum mechanics. So, vacuum is not that vacuum, but still things are emitting and they are so on. So, here it comes, the field itself is not directly observable. I mean to say, if you talk of the visibility factor, then how do we imagine the field? They are not observable. We can only observe the consequences of the excitations. Let me give you a very simple analogy. So, here is the pond, right? And it has got ripples. So, uh, what happens is that, say, so if I try to imagine the water that is the field, it is not the water I cannot see right from the top, right? The water is not visible. Now, imagine somebody, uh, I mean to say, throwing a rock and it creates the ripples. So, what are the ripples? So, the ripples on the pond are basically the excitations, right? Caused by what? This one, throwing a rock on the, uh, on the field, on the pond. And that throwing the rock is the interaction. And you cannot directly see the underlying water that is the field, but only see the ripples that it creates. So, this is a nice analogy. I think this would create a lot of confusions to be cleared. And the field is a quantum entity. It is not a continuous function, but rather, as I uh, have written on the left-hand side, a collection of quantum states, uh, I would say, which has a particular, I would say, energy levels or something like that. So, this is uh, quite truly amazing and uh, the throwing of the rock is the interaction, the field is the water, water is the field and the ripples are only the excitation or the consequences where the particles come as a manifestation, we can say. So, as I was telling that there is not just one universal uh, quantum uh, field, quantum field theory proposes a separate field of each particle. So, there is an electron field, a photon field and there might be different types of field and each field, remember, governs the behavior of a separate uh, corresponding particle. So, what it says is that, say for example, if I take two fields, field 1 and field 2, and particle interactions, say for example, these two fields are, uh, I mean to say, interacting. So, particle interactions in QFT are described by through interaction between underlying fields. So, let us imagine two fields interacting, creating or destroying excitations, the process. This allows to give us some much more holistic picture of how particles interact by looking at the underlying field. And that is how, I mean to say, things really uh, uh, create and annihilate and something like that. So, from here, what we can deduce is this gross understanding that uh, understanding fields in QFT is very crucial. Why? Because it provides a framework that seamlessly integrates uh, special relativity and it allows for the creation and annihilation of particles. 
unlike the more limited picture which is offered by classical particles in quantum mechanics remember when i am saying classical quantum mechanics is obviously not classical it is quantum but i am trying to take an analogy that it behaves just like classical particles which has behavior of momentum position energy etc so can we uh, you know uh, get it into a clean picture so i will talk of the feature what is the nature it is localized objects for qft it is mathematical objects filling all space time it is described by obviously vague function which are schrodinger's equation we will describe more when we get the mathematical differences here it is quantum fields the relationship to particles are these are fundamental entities in quantum mechanics but here particles are excitations of fields you can say that it is a kind of a manifestation just like space time curvature is a manifestation so you can say that particles are manifestation but in quantum mechanics they are absolutely fundamental entities creation and annihilation of particles never quantum mechanics is never <laughs> specifically addressed and here quantum field theory allowed through field operators dynamics is obviously determined determined by schrodinger equation it is here de obviously defined by lagrangian and hamiltonian formalism quantum mechanics is non relativistic and quantum field theory is definitely relativistic with special relativity coming hand in hand so uh, the first part is the conceptual a uh, mental shift from classical i would say not classical physics i would say quantum mechanics which considers particle as classical like particles and from there we move into a far more abstract area which are the field and how these fields operate things will more become clear when we talk of the mathematical differences between quantum mechanics and quantum field theory these things will become much more clearer coming up to the next part of the video so in quantum mechanics let us remember that we typically deal with finite dimensional hilbert spaces which is nothing but this one complex number raised to the power 9 so the now again you might ask why it is finite dimensional because it is related to something which is finite so qft on the other hand introduces several other uh, i would say additional layers of complexity now you see uh, it deals with infinite dimensional hilbert spaces i will just justify what do i mean by that now here you see from the discrete nature of particles in quantum mechanics the moment we shift into continuous nature obviously that discrete part is now continuous and most importantly this continuous means that it will carry on and on and on why because the field permeates all the space so obviously it cannot be at a definite position in a space and with our dear professor albert einstein this old man and his special theory of relativity uh, fits seamlessly with quantum field theory so what i am trying to make a point is that quantum mechanics can very well be learned using linear algebra complex analysis differential equations and probability theory because it is finite the moment we move from this discrete nature to continuous nature in a permeable space time where the uh, i would say the things are quite long and our dear old professor einstein special theory of relativity needs to be integrated we need these things we need function and analysis we need distribution theory we need a little bit of differential geometry group theory and gauge theory so i mean to say it is not difficult apart from linear algebra and all those things these needs to be done so that is basically the mathematical differences moreover the treatment of interactions also includes this thing that you have to take up a broom and you have to clear a lot of infinities yes uh, i talked to professor saumitra sen uh, he told me that he would come to a podcast and he can talk a lot about renormalization which is a very big subject of quantum field theory so let us understand that the treatment and interactions of renormalization and handling infinities i mean to say in perturbative calculations can add a lot of significant complexities so the first difference is that it is from a finite dimensional hilbert space to an infinite dimensional hilbert space we are removing infinities and we are incorporating special theory of relativity so now we come to the thing that what are the mathematical notations because you see there are a lot of you know students get confused with lot of new notations coming up so in quantum mechanics you get this bra and the cat vector 
Uh, so I mean to say, we all know this. I have made a lot of videos on how to introduce brand get the inner product, then uh, what is called the cross product, and then you get the norm. So so this is quite known. Uh, every I, I I mean to say graduate undergraduate, we know what are the notations. Now let us see what are the notations in quantum field theory. I've taken a excerpt of the book of Amitabh and Palash. So here you see the first thing that you need to understand is G mu nu, and what is that metric tensor. So automatically the shift happens. The curly L, the Lagrangian density, then the total Lagrangian, the Hamiltonian, the Poisson bracket, commutator, anti-commutator, and on the right hand end you see there is a Feynman propagator. There are uh, you know fine structure constant. Then you get parity transformation operator and a lot of things. So what I am trying to make a point is that the shift is not only in terms of the mathematics, but your eyes and brain and your mind needs to be trained and needs to understand that, hey, come on, these are the new notations. They are nothing difficult, but we need to remember those things. And this notations actually speaks of a language, which is this. So there is a definite shift in terms of notations in quantum field theory also. Okay, next we come how the dynamics of quantum uh, mechanics and quantum field theory are different. So, in quantum mechanics, uh, it is governed by Schrodinger equation and obviously Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which are the equations of motion. Uh, I mean, to say, which are typically uh, differential equations, we can say, and acting on the wave functions. But when we take of quantum field theory, dynamics are typically described by Lagrangian and Hamiltonian formalism, which involves field and their derivatives and most importantly, the equations of motion are also guided by what is called the Dirac equation and the Klein-Gordon equation. Now, regarding this formalism of Lagrangian and Hamiltonian, if you go to my live lectures on quantum field theory in my channel, on my channel Physics for Students, you will find that I have discussed on that. And not only go to how to learn quantum theory, the mathematical part, I have made four videos just speaking on Lagrangian and Hamiltonian. Now, you might be wondering, what is Dirac equation? Well, well, that would take a different video, but here is a quick excerpt of what is Dirac equation. It was developed by this wonderfully handsome person, Paul Dirac, in 1928. It actually takes the relativistic part, I mean, just a special relativity for particles with spin like electrons. It takes special relativity and it predicts a major discovery. And you know what it is? It is called antiparticles. And that was the major discovery and a contribution of Paul Dirac. Coming to Klein-Gordon equation, it was discovered by Oscar Klein and Walter Gordon in 1926. It also considers relativistic uh, quantum mechanics, but it takes into account spinless particles like mesons. And it is much simpler than Dirac equation, and it can be interpreted as the field equation for a scalar field in quantum field theory. And it has got its other limitations, <laughs> which I am not considering in the video. So, the quantum mechanics straight away mastered the Schrodinger equation and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You are done. But here you have to learn Lagrangian, you have to learn Hamiltonian, you have to learn Dirac equation, and you have to also learn the Klein Gordon equation. Talking of how the states are represented, very simple. It is represented by wave function like this. And in quantum theory, it is denoted by this phi x, which is actually a kind of a different symbol. These are field configurations in space fields, which can be in finite dimension. Okay, here is a time which where we can quickly rack, wrap up the mathematical differences. The first feature would be observable quantities. And as you can see, in quantum mechanics, interactions are typically perturbations. So they are basically localized objects. And here, mathematical objects feels all space time. What is that mathematical object? Simple, it is called the quantum field that we deal with the field part. If I talk of interactions, then the interactions are treated as perturbations to the Hamiltonian. But here, interactions are inherent to the dynamics and the Lagrangian Hamiltonian describes how fields interact. Vacuum structure, the vacuum is often considered the state with no particles. Uh, I mean to say, represented by the ground state of the system. In QFT, the vacuum is more complex because featuring vacuum fluctuations and vacu virtual particle and antiparticles, a dynamic entity with non-living structure. What are the techniques that are involved? As I, I have told you earlier, relies heavily on linear algebra, differential equations, but here you have to include what is called uh, path integral and Feynman uh, diagrams, renormalizations, etc. 
Now, up till now, we have all understood the mathematical difference, how differences help us in a better understanding. But the question rises that, is it all about differences? Are there any relationships between these two great theories, quantum mechanics and quantum field theory? Let us find it out in the next part of the video. What are the relationships between quantum mechanics and quantum field theory? The first thing is that quantum field theory definitely can be seen as an extension of quantum mechanics. And what is that extension? To incorporate the principles of special relativity and to describe system with an indefinite number of, uh, I would say, particles. And such particles as, I mean to say, fields. So, in the context of quantum field theory, particles are considered as this, those people who are dancing right in front of you. I mean to say, these are excitations of underlying fields. So, the relationship is that it, it, it is an extension. And it incorporates the principles of relativity. Why? Because we have to define something on an indefinite Hilbert space. And particles are no longer billiard balls, but they are just excitations in the field. This is one of them. The second, really, yeah, particles are considered excitation. The second thing which is strikingly important is that quantum uh, mechanics is often considered as the non-relativistic limit of quantum field theory. Okay, what do I mean by the non-relativistic limit? I will tell you where the relativistic effects are negligible. Okay, and quantum field theory actually encompasses, uh, I would say, quantum mechanics, but provides a more comprehensive framework for describing fundamental interactions, particularly in the realm of high energy physics, etc. Now, if you have seen my early uh, a video on general theory of relativity, where I have shown that general theory of relativity, when it works under very slow movement, etc., it comes down to Newtonian mechanics and so on. So, when I say that the quantum mechanics is the non-relativistic limit, that means if from quantum field theory, if we remove the relativistic part, then we can very well go back to quantum mechanics. That is the idea. So, it is the non-relativistic limit. So, considering and uh, deducting the relativistic parts, it will very well uh, come back to the quantum mechanics. That is beautiful. As a real theory, just like general relativity, it can trace and go back to quantum mechanics. So, here are a few of the important points between the relationships. First is that quantum mechanics serves as the foundation of QFT and that is why you first need to master quantum mechanics before moving into QFT. The second part is that when dealing with situations of where special relativity is negligible, just like general relativity becomes negligible, QFT calculations can reduce and go back to the equations which are very, very standard in quantum mechanics. Also, quantum mechanics provides essential understanding of the quantum nature of particles and in QFT it is incorporated into fields and quantum mechanics and quantum field theory are basically complementary description of the same subatomic world. Quantum mechanics excels in describing behavior of individual particles while quantum field theory shines in explaining particle interaction most importantly the creation and the annihilation processes. Time to wrap up with some of the major differences in a tabular form. So, approach of quantum mechanics is behavior of matter and energy at the subatomic level. Here, it is subatomic particles and their interactions with special relativity. Particles and fields considers particles as fundamental entities and quantum field theory would consider view particles as excitations. Creation and annihilation, obviously quantum mechanics does not uh, dis, uh, uh, explicitly says and here it defines and this is applicable to electrons in atoms and interaction. Most importantly, quantum field theory can uh, be, be, be stretched into high energy physics uh, and even into condensed matter physics. So, mathematics is purely Schrodinger and Heisenberg's equation and here it introduces the concept like path integral which are more powerful tool for calculating prob probabilities and uh, observable quantities here are basically Hermitian operators and here observables are represented by the operator valued fields and their correlations. So, uh, what do we learn? What, what did we learn from today's video? Here is a quick summary. Why should we learn the differences in concept that is extremely important? Because we saw that learning the differences helps us a lot to master and know the subtle intricacies of those subjects. How learning the differences help? The conceptual part difference between quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, which, which was particles and fields and mathematical difference. And not only that, there is a good amount of good friendly relationship between these two people, that is quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. 
so that's it for today's video i immensely thank you for watching this video please do subscribe and click on the bell icon to get all the notification from physics for students you can like write to me in this channel and please don't forget to uh, subscribe to my other channel general relativity explain where i just exclusively post videos and shorts on general theory of relativity follow me if you want on my facebook instagram linkedin and my twitter channel uh, just a quick reminder on the 31st of march i am conducting a free webinar on einstein general theory of relativity so if you're really interested please do write to my this email id and i'm happy that i'm getting a good amount of people and participants thank you very much physics for students will be soon back with more interesting videos till then goodbye